I'm, uh, I'm George Gilchrist. I'm the chair of the uh, Stephen J. Gould Prize Award Committee, and it's our pleasure tonight to uh, welcome uh, Professor Steve Jones here from uh, University College in London. The Gould Prize is awarded annually by the Society for the Study of Evolution to recognize individuals who have exemplified a, a sustained and outstanding effort in advancing the public understanding of evolutionary science and its importance in biology, education, and everyday life. Of course, this is what we remember Stephen Jay Gould for, uh, his, his lengthy uh, career writing some of the most eloquent prose uh, about evolution in a way that was inspiring and attractive both to professionals and to the general public. And it's very much in that spirit that this guy, also named Steve, who also works on snail color polymorphism, has also written a great deal of literature about evolution in both the private, public, and professional world. Steve Jones is best known in, in England as a very eloquent spokesperson uh, who has written 11 books, have been translated into 12 languages. Among the best known of these are The Language of Genes, which won the 1994 Rhone Poulenc Science Book Prize, Darwin's Ghost, The Origin of Species Updated, which reviews Darwin's great ideas in the light of modern science, and his most recent book, available today in the United States, The Serpent's Promise, The Bible Retold as Science. Professor Joan is, is a regular contributor to radio, television, and newspapers on a variety of scientific subjects. And he's recently appeared in a radio series on the legacy of Darwin. He's written extensively on, uh, on scientific issues and has a regular column in the Daily Telegraph called View from the Lab, which has appeared more than 400 times since 1993. Steve's got a strong commitment to education. He's spoken to over 200,000 school children directly and at many educational conferences. He's won awards for uh, public outreach, including the Royal si Society Faraday Medal for the Public Understanding of Science in 1997, the Institute of Biology Charter Medal in 2007, the Linnaean si Society Tercentenary Medal in 2008, along with Sir David Attenborough and Professor E.O. Wilson, and the Zoological Society of London Book Prize in 2008. Steve has focused, as I said, uh, in his scientific career on snail shell color polymorphism. He was the head of the Department of Je Genetics and Biometry at the University College in London from 1990 to 1994, and again served in that role from 2008 to 2010. He's been Vice President of the United K Kingdom Genetic Society, President of the Galton Institute, is a trustee and board member of the UK Stem Cell Foundation, the Charles Darwin Foundation, the Society of Authors, and was President of the Association for Science Education in 2011. It's for these and many other accomplishments that uh, our society recognizes the contributions of Professor Steve Jones with the Gould Prize. Steve's talk tonight is titled Snails in Art and the Art of Snails, An Evolutionist Journey Through Science and the Arts. 
<coughs> Thanks for that. Uh, I'm not sure I deserve all that praise. I knew Steve Gould pretty well, um, and I, I can uh, inform you with a certain amount of confidence that I will not talk for two and a half hours tonight. <laughs> um, I once said to Steve, you know, um, we're two of the best known, um, we took two of the best of the top half dozen snail geneticists in the world, and the other four agree. Um, <laughs> But now there's only five of us, unfortunately, with the, with the, with the, uh, with the demise of, of Steve. And Steve, of course, was a, was a great, um, not just a popularizer of science, he was, a, he was an enthusiast for science. And that's what it really counts. You can't popularize science unless you're enthusiastic about it. And that's what really showed in Steve's writings. But I think perhaps particularly the early ones, um, perhaps less so the last and highly monumental one, um, the structure of evolutionary theory, was a genuine enthusiasm and interest in what was going on. And if, you're if you don't have that, you cannot communicate science. I'm asked again and again, and I'm sure many of you have been asked the same thing, how can I learn to communicate science? You can't learn to communicate science. You can, we all communicate scientists, science, but only to other scientists. And you can't fake enthusiasm to, under sci to other scientists, and you can't do it to the public. So it's not what you need is not knowledge, uh, it's not intelligence, uh, both of which I lack, but you certainly need to feel enthusiastic. And I hope I can show you this that in this talk. So this, slide, this uh, first slide here, I put up uh, partly because it's a book I wrote some years ago. Not a particularly great book, I have to say. But I had a bright idea, which was that the best-selling book ever, probably, in biological science is Jim Watson's very eccentric and amusing book, The Double Helix. And the snail I worked on, uh, his Latin name was initially Helix. It changed its name to Sapir, but now it's gone back to being Helix again. And that's a picture of the snail, which I'll talk about much more in this talk on the cover. I have to say, the, uh, I wrote it for a somewhat ignoble reason. I reckon that even if the book wasn't half as good as the double Helix, if it earned half as much, I'd be very happy. But unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately it didn't. Um, however, that's the introduction. These are, these are the... Um, these are, uh, this is the theme of this talk, population genetics of land snails, with some swerves off, perhaps, into the art. I mean, once, it's kind of soft science. I was once at a dinner party in London talking about this and that, and a number of Greek people there, as it happened, and somebody asked me out of the blue, what do you call somebody who works on snails? And I said, a malacologist, whereupon they fell laughing uncontrollably to the floor. And I said, why was this? It turns out that the word has a Greek root, which is malaka, which means soft and floppy, and is a very, very rude word in, spa in Greek. Uh, so, as I said, this is soft science, and I speak as a malacologist here. Okay. One of the little-known facts, perhaps, about snail population genetics is that nobody ever gets famous until they stop doing it. And, of course, Steve was the classic example of that. He was a highly productive scientist uh, early in life and was well-known among other scientists, but he didn't enter the public arena until he stopped... Um, publishing in only on snails and started publishing on things uh, on, in a much wider field. And that uh, story of getting famous when you stop doing snails goes back a surprisingly long way. This is a picture of the first book on snails ever published in the United States, the first popular book on snails ever published in the United States. The Conchologist's first book, A System of Testaceous Malacology Exranged, Arranged Expressly for the Use of Schools. Now, here's the title page. Um, if you read all the, way, all the way down, QVA shells by a guy called Edgar A. Poe. Who the hell was he? What happened to him? That was Edgar Allan Poe's first book, okay? Um, so he gave up writing books about snails. He wrote The Pit and the Pendulum, and he became rich. And there, um, and there he is, Edgar Allan Poe. And there were many people um, who, uh, who uh, were keen on snails uh, and became famous when they stopped. This is one of them. This is the Reverend Charles Dodgson, otherwise known as Lewis Carroll. And it, rather than brackets, I was astonished to discover when I was writing my most recent book, uh, the one which is the Bible updated, I have to say I'm rather, I'm rather uh, nervous about mentioning that in this particular state, but if people want to see, if the locals want to burn my book, they're welcome to do so long, as long as they buy it first. Um, <laughs> but but, um, but uh, Edgar Allan, but uh, uh, Dodgson um, uh, was interested in snails, um, and uh, he uh, actually wrote the name of a snail in his famous um, Through the Looking Class book, 
where that we go through the looking glass and all kinds of bizarre things happen. Various famous lines come out of it. Here we have, beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. Okay? Now, I don't know what a jabberwock is. I have no idea how to identify the jubjub bird. Steve Gould probably could, I have to tell you. Um, and, uh, but I do know what the bandersnatch is because I was reading a paper in German a few years ago and here we have a paper on the uh, diversity and structure of the polymorphism of the bandersnatch, bandersnecken, sepia hortensis and sepia nemorelis. And the bandersneck is indeed a banded snail. So, again, give up working on it and you become much better known. So let's look a little bit now about the, the role of snails in art before we go on to talk about the science. Now, some of it is straightforward represent representational art. I could give you many examples. Here's, a fam here's the famous uh, uh, cathedral in Barcelona, the Sagrada Familia, um, by Gaudi, and a, a marvelous, breathtaking building. And if you look carefully, you'll see some mollusks crawling up the side of the cathedral there. And if you look particularly carefully, they look like mice now. They look like uh, helix appear. And in fact, I've done a lot of work in the Spanish Pyrenees, which I'll come back to, um, working on them there. So I'd like to think that maybe Gaudi also knew those snails. Okay? That's one representational issue. Here's another one, which is in the Tate Gallery in London. That's the Matisse cutout paper um, thing on snails. Uh, when he lost his ability, his eyesight almost, and he was doing cutouts. I went to an exhibition actually just the other week of his cutouts, which is really quite magnificent. Um, and this happens again and again. And it's an old, old story of people using snails simply as works of art. If you go into medieval manuscripts, it turns out that there are literally hundreds of images of snails in such things. And the marginalia, they're shown in various strange, um, in strange. Um, uh, poses, maybe sh illustrating, as we'll see later, perhaps the three great issues of, of sex, age, and death. And again and again, artists have used snails uh, to, point, to, point, to point a moral. We talked about malacology, okay, and one of the better known snail images that comes from a fellow countryman um, of the man who designed the cathedral of, uh, of Gaudi, and that's Salvador Dali. And this is Dali's woman with snail, which if I've, had, if, I've, if I've never seen any image of impotence, that's it. Uh, this is an image of impotence. I, uh, Salvador Dali, I always remember as his name can be broken up and rearranged as Avida Dollars. I would like some money, because he, uh, he was not the most uh, honest, perhaps, uh, artist, but he was a very great artist. And that's Dali's woman with a snail. Snails as an image of, of, sexu of sexual failure. Now, that image goes further. Here's a somewhat more less expected image, perhaps. Here we have a annunci an Annunciation. There's the Virgin Mary uh, about to undergo the Annunciation. And this is by Francesco del Cosa. Um, and if you look carefully at the bottom there, uh, the bottom, I, I didn't bring my free pointer with me, unfortunately. Um, if you look at the bottom, about uh, 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 an eighth of the way up and about a quarter of the way from the left, you'll see an object there which is a snail coolly processing across the front of this, of this painting. So what's that all about? If the dew, it's because there is, a, there is a, a quote, if the dew of the clear air can make the snail pregnant, then God in, vir in virtue can make Jesus is his mother pregnant. And the claim was, which I can assure you is entirely mistaken, is that snails manage to reproduce without sex because they had this hard, impregnable sh uh, shell. Um, they couldn't have sex, therefore they had the virgin birth. All right. Um, I am sure to shock you, but that isn't true. Um, snails go in for sex in a way which is probably more obscure and more daring than almost any other creature. And one of the reasons why they get so daring about sex is, in fact, many of them, including my own species, is a, are hermaphrodites. Okay? Um, and hermaphrodites, of course, again, common images in art. Here's a wonderful sculpture by Bernini called the Sleeping Hermaphrodite. And hermaphrodites are, of course, simultaneously male and female. Well, if you're simultaneously male and female, boy-girl meets girl-boy. And what do you want to be in that, uh, in that uh, contest? Obviously, you want to be the boy. 
You don't want to have to pay the school fees, bring up the children, that kind of stuff. You want to impregnate the female and get out of it as quickly as possible, um, which is male behavior in general in the animal world, as we well know. Um, but being simultaneously male and female makes life a bit more complicated, makes life an awful lot more complicated, actually. And sometimes these creatures go to extreme lengths to ensure that they are the boy. Um, if you look at slugs, for example, which all of which were once shelled snails, they're degenerate snails, they've lost their, they've lost their shells. Um, if you look at slugs, for example, you find them quite often, both in the US with a banana slug and the West Coast and in Britain, you can see them in the spring morning hanging from a rope of slime from a tree, a pair of them uh, circling around, sometimes for hours, sometimes even a couple of days, um, with large white objects hanging out of them. Uh, those objects are in fact their two penises with which they club each other into, into, into submission in the hope of, uh, p of persuading the other one to accept the penis and keep the other one's penis out of oneself. Uh, we a student and I discovered a few years ago a very strange phenomenon in a particular species of slug called Orion, which we call apophallation interesting phrase, uh, and in that species, one of the slugs succeeds in biting the penis off the other one, ensuring indeed that it remains only as a female, um, and so he's won, he's won the game, okay? Well, snails aren't quite as daring as that, but they do go into some quite tricky uh, negotiations between males and females. Um, unlike slugs, they're not simultaneous hermaphrodites, um, but uh, they do argue about who's going, to be, who's going to be the boy. Here's an image which illustrates what they do. Here's a bouchie uh, of Cupid wounding Psyche. There you see him, uh, Cupid, fluttering in the background with his, uh, his uh, quiver of arrows, um, uh, about to shoot them into, the, into poor Psyche, who's going to be immediately be transfixed, literally and metaphorically, uh, by this experience and fall for Cupid. And if you look at some of these early uh, images of snails I talked about, quite a common one is exactly that. Here we have an archer, a snail archer, uh, shooting his arrow, not at uh, Cupid, uh, not at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Psyche, I have to say, but at least at a, at a rabbit. And that's quite a common image. And actually snails do that. If you put pairs of snails, a pair of snails, into a clear plastic box, put some wet uh, uh, paper on the bottom um, and uh, leave them overnight, quite often when you come back in the morning uh, you will find little things which were once called love darts scattered along the bottom of the box. Now in human terms they're about this big, okay? And at one time, in the, in the happy days of sort of 1950s biology, when it all turned into sort of, before it all turned into sort of modified form of mass murder, which is what animal behavior really has now become, it, they were called love darts, and it was thought, oh, I like you very much, so I'm going to poke this enormous sharp dart into you, which is half as big as you are, in order to prove the power of my affections, okay? Well, that didn't make much sense. It didn't make no sense at all. But then there came the rather comforting feeling it was kind of a trading of a nuptial gift, which of course you get a lot of insects, that the male brings a gift to the female who then allows him to mate with her. So maybe the argument went that these darts are expensive to make, and they are expensive to make, they're made of calcium carbonate, um, and snails need that in order to make their shells. So the notion was that somehow the, uh, the, the blushing bride accepted this nuptial gift, absorbed it, and allowed the male part of the other one to mate with her. But nope, it ain't as simple as that. In fact, it's a hormonal, it's a hormonal system. Um, if you look at a fresh dart, uh, look at the top there of this next slide, you will see that this is what you see in the, sh in the bottom of the, in the, bottom of the, um, of the cage, uh, but uh, you see this uh, dry, cl clean, dry, sharp dart. But if you, if you dissect the animal before it mates, you find that it's covered with mucus. And that mucus contains a hormone um, uh, females, or the individual who is acting as a female, can store sperm, as often happens in uh, invertebrates. Uh, she can mate with a male and store his sperm, uh, sometimes for a considerable time, before releasing it, perhaps in the hope, in inverted commas, of coming into contact with another male of higher quality. Well, what this, uh, this, what this mucus does, it contains a hormone that forces the female to use the sperm which the latest male has actually, uh, has actually provided. So it's a way of cheating on the female, as it were, um, using, using, uh, using hormones. Well, we've talked about the bizarre behavior of slugs and the way in which they go much further than shooting darts at each other. They actually bite bits off each other. And this notion of sexual conflict ending in bloodshed 
again, is quite common in art. Um, here's, a, uh, here's a Gaia painting of Cron. These are one of the black paintings, and later in his life, as I'm sure you'll know, uh, Gaia painted a large number of paintings on large black surfaces showing despair and anger and rage at the terrible state, state uh, uh, Spain was then in. And there's a famous one, uh, Kronos devouring his children. And you can see this terrible image of this frightful beast, Kronos, eating his children. Um, okay. Now, Kronos was not the most charming individual. He'd actually previously uh, castrated his father, and his father was Uranus. Now, Uranus was castrated by Kronos, um, and strangely enough, that has a tie on a particular mollusk and also a particular myth mythical figure called Aphrodite. Here's a, this is Aphrodite, the sea hare, which is a shellless marine mollusk, a very beautiful thing. And here's the famous Botticelli, Aphrodite emerging from the inverted commas, foam. Because after um, uh, Uranus had been castrated by Kronos, his appropriate male parts were thrown into the sea, where they became the foam. Okay? So that stuff which is foam is in fact sperm. And here we have a classic case of a hidden message in a painting, perhaps not, not much talked about, but it's nevertheless the case. It's got a strong sexual message. She is emerging virgin and immaculate from a sea of sperm, which is a very beautiful biological, if not artistic, image. I hope you'll agree. So that snails and sex have a great deal to do with each other, as indeed do snails and death. Okay, here's a uh, picture from a, a gravestone, actually near where I come from in West Wales in Cardiganshire. I remember seeing when I was a kid lots and lots of gravestones with in long impenetrable Welsh sentences on them with snails on them. And I could never see why that was, but in fact um, the reason is that snails are thought to become resurrected. The, uh, the quote from Psalm 58 is like a snail that melteth away into slime, they shall be taken away. Okay, snails die, they melt into slime. But not all of them do. Some snails, and I'll return to this uh, discussion at more length in a moment, some snails manage to die and then, and then be born again, at least or so it appears. Here's a snail um, which is um, common around the Mediterranean. It's a real pest in California. It was a pest on the East Coast too. I, they did manage to get rid of it. I think it's coming back now. And this is a thing called Fema pisana. It's a, and it, it's, a, it's a Mediterranean snail around the, uh, which is spread all over the world and is a major, major crop pest. But what's interesting about it, that in the summer, it climbs up, often in vast numbers, onto branches and the like, and basically, in inverted commas, dies. Uh, these things just stay there without moving for months on end. And then when the rains come, um, the, uh, they suddenly they're resurrected, they come back to life, there's a second coming of Thema Pisana, uh, and, they, and there they are, they've, they've come back to an existence after a time perhaps being dead. What, well, that's interesting enough, but why do they climb? And they climb for reasons which are perhaps not as widely known as might be hoped. Uh, which has to do with the nature of heat on the Earth's surface. It's a great deal of concern now, of course, about global warming, um, uh, but the thing which is really interesting about, uh, clim about climate and genetics, climate and evolution, is the fact that there is enormous amount of local adaptation to climate, apart from any adaptation that may be taking place over the long term, or in, in, as happens bet between, let, let's say, tropical animals and animals in the north, or adaptations which may be happening now with time, with claims that particular species of creature have changed their thermal niche as, uh, as, as the, as the, as the, as the uh, world work, uh, warms up. And what I'll talk about is this issue of thermal niche, this issue of how you deal with heat stress in a particular snail. And actually, what the central point about thermal niche, the central point for an invertebrate, and indeed for a vertebrate, like most of us, um, is to get away from the Earth's surface. Because that's where the heat is. On a sunny day, the temperature on the surface of the Earth, to within a centimeter or so above the surface of the Earth, can be 15, 20, or even more degrees higher than the temp temperature, let's say, half a meter above the surface. And that's why these snails climb. They climb to uh, escape that very stressful niche. Well, let's look, have a look at the snail I work on. A very beautiful animal, I think you'll agree. That's Sapir, Sapir nemorelis, 
Um, it's been worked on for many, many years. And there was a time when Steve, and Steve Gould actually came to the conference. I think he'd, I hate to think of it. When was it? 1974. God, 40 years ago. Um, when I ran a conference on snail population genetics in London, and something like 80 people came. And we had a most thrilling time talking about nothing but snail polymorphism for three or four days. Now, as I say, there's only four of us left. Um, but I'm, but I, I don't really regret having passed my, or perhaps wasted, my scientific career by working on this thing because although the results may not be particularly interesting, the question is, and the question then, when I started on this in the 60s and before that when the previous generation of snail people started on this in the 30s, 40s and 50s, the question was, as it still is, why is there so much genetic variation? Okay, that's a central question of evolutionary biology which remains largely unanswered. Now, in the 1950s, and indeed in the mid-60s when I started, um, there were very few creatures where you could ask that question. It's almost impossible for the younger people in the audience to realize what an extraordinary state we're in now. We can ask that question of anything we like with a bit of a, a few, piece, a few uh, with a DNA sequencing machine, and we can answer it. But in those days, uh, there were a few snails, some butterflies, human blood groups. That was about it. There was very little you could work on to ask about diversity. And the snail was one of them. And it varies, as you can see, in shell color, shell stripes. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. That's completely changed. Now we face not the problem of too little diversity, not enough to work on, but of course, the problem of too much. Here we have, a, as I always say to my first year students, get this down, it's going to be in the exam. Um, this is a, a very familiar image of a, a single point mutations, so SNPs um, in places in DNA where there are differences in DNA letters, about three uh, once every thousand letters, there's three million in a typical human genome, and of course plenty of other differences too in terms of deletions, duplications, inversions, translocations, God knows what, um, massive amounts of variation. It's clearly the case, as, it, as everybody in this room knows, that everybody in this room is different from everybody else, unless you happen to be identical twins. And oddly enough, my mother was an identical twin, although I don't think that's why I became a geneticist. Um, everybody in this room is different, um, everybody in the world is different genetically. That, not only that is true, everybody who ever has lived or ever will live is different genetically. And if you really want the stunning figure, which I believe to be true, every sperm and every egg ever made by everyone who ever has lived or ever will live is different from all the others. Okay? So what we've got is an, Im an embarrassment of diversity. We've got too much of it. And what's happening, I have to say with some passion, is that we're reliving the experience of what happened with Sapir snails. Because no less a figure than R.A. Fisher, the theoretical geneticist, said in the 1930s that these variants we've just seen, these things here, are neutral. They're random. Who cares whether you're you know, stripy or not stripy? Who cares whether you're pink or yellow? It can't make any difference at all. And of course, if you read the molecular literature, you get that talk, you get that story again. In my view, an awful lot of molecular, molecular geneticists, if not molecular evolutionists, are actually secret creationists. What's actually happened is God has made this variation and we don't have to worry about why it's there. It's because it was decided up on high. There is a reason why it's there. We don't know what it is, but that, that, there's no reason not to study it. Um, and surprisingly few people are doing that. Plenty of people are asking why it's different from place to place, and that's it, but that's a different question. Why is there? We don't know. But we, do, we are beginning to know part of the story about why the snail stuff is there. Um, here's <coughs> an example of two snails picked up from the cell, sm same population. And we've bred these things up, and these variants are genetic. And they vary, in this case, in having no stripes in one of them and having the five stripes fused together in the other. In other words, they vary from being more or less black from being more or less white. And it's quite common to find variants of that kind in the same population. Now, one reason might be, and some of you may know this from the evolution of biology textbooks of maybe of the 1970s and 80s, that might have to do with uh, predation and camouflage. Um, here we have uh, the, uh, an image of, of bird predation. Um, there's, only two, there's only two jokes about snails, which uh, snail people make to each other. When you find one of these thrush stones, which is uh, somewhere where a stone, where, where, where a bird has found snails and bashed them against each other, we say, my God, it, that, one, that one's got shell shock. 
Um, and the answer, the answer to that is, oh, yes, it must come from a broken home. Um, okay. And famously, Cain and Shepherd in the 1960s claimed that it was, uh, it was predation that drove the, the, the polymorphism. They, put, they were probably wrong. It may have done some, something about it locally, uh, but in general, it doesn't. There is an artistic spin just to get some art in, um, because, of course, people who uh, are interested in images are very interested in, in, in camouflage. And here's a famous uh, Edward Wadsworth painting of a dazzle ship. The ship which is painted in stripes, or the stripes being about the same size as the breaking waves, to hide it, and there we have a good, two good bits of biology, a zebra and a frog, doing exactly the same thing. So, okay, here we have this polymorphism, this variation. Why is it there? Well, as I say, I hope I can persuade you that at least partly we're beginning to get some idea. We've known for quite a long time, I did my PhD on, on this with uh, uh, the very wonderful Brian Clark, who unfortunately died a few weeks ago. Um, I did my PhD in what later became ex-Yugoslavia, and I did a lot of work on the snails of northern Yugoslavia, and then I worked in the Pyrenees. Uh, and uh, uh, one, of the, one of the great things about it appears is it only, work, it only lives in national parks. It's a wonderful animal to, live, to work with. Um, and it's clear that across Europe <coughs> there is a striking cline, a geographical trend, in the, in the frequency of light-colored yellow shells. And if you draw, this is a, a, this, these are just the 2009 samples, uh, but if you draw uh, a, a diagram of the fit between the, inter the incidence of the yellow allele, the light-colored, almost colorless form, and the mean July temperature, it is absolutely linear. You tend to get light-colored creatures in relatively hot places. Okay? So why is that? It has something to do with, with our question in the sun. It is the case that um, snails live, like many invertebrates, on the edge of a thermal cliff. They're sitting in a, they're in a situation where they have to keep their body temperature within rather narrow ranges. If it's too low, they haven't got enough oomph, as we scientists say, to go out and mate and feed. If it's too high, they get not shell shock, but they get heat shock. They activate the heat shock proteins, and then they die. So they have to really titrate their behavior very carefully. Now, that's also true, of course, of humans. You tend to forget that, although I went for a walk around Rory this afternoon, and I was titrating my behavior pretty hard by the end of it, by going on the shady side of the, of the, um, of the street. Um, here's an here's a, uh, uh, exhibition which we had in the Tate Modern a few years ago, a guy called Eliasson, who produced this sun. And it was amazing. Thousands of people went to see this, this exhibition. Um, and you can see, uh, and it really was quite a startling thing to see, huge. Uh, you can see people holding up the sun, lots of people lying down to look at the sun. And you tend to forget that the sun, certainly in historic terms, uh, drove our own behavior too. I think the generally accepted theory of human uh, bipedalism has to do, uh, at least in part, with thermoregulation. Humans are the animals that can thermoregulate. Uh, chimps and so on cannot. That's, part one. That's one of the reasons why they spend their time in the trees. Humans, by, simply by standing upright, uh, reduce the amount of, um, of uh, solar radiation, radiation that comes in. And perhaps more important, they pull themselves out of that windless no region near the, uh, near the ground where it can be extraordinarily hot. And nobody in their right mind would lie um, on the ground to get a tan in, in, in Raleigh on a day like today, because they would probably die of heat stroke. So th even in humans, this behavioral thermoregulation, this standing up in order to get out of the heat, is common. As I said, it's also common in FIBA. Now, we've done a number of things with Sapir. One of the more mindless ones is to take a large number of snails from different populations from Scotland to where it lives in the southern limit in, in Spain, and to uh, use what we technically call a molluscatron. And the molluscatron is simply a, a plastic tube into which you add snails, and you ask how, how, fi how high they climb. What's interesting, actually, is the stri there's a striking tendency for creatures from the south of the range, in the same conditions, to climb higher than those in the north. So they seem to have an evolved tendency to climb out of that um, superheated uh, air um, near the ground. Now, I can assure you in places like Aberdeen, they don't often have that problem. Uh, you, don't, you don't get much superheated air in, in the north limits of Scotland. So they don't do it. They stay down there. It's actually gone a bit further than that because they've actually adjusted their pain sensitivity to go, to, to, fit, to, to, uh, to, to match. I once asked a colleague, I have a colleague 
who um, works on pain so sensitivity in mice. And as you can imagine, the, the biology, the genetics of pain, is an enormous field because many people, of course, have, uh, suffer from pain. There's great interest in, in, in drugs to control it. And some people have chronic uncontrollable pain, which cannot be, cannot be uh, uh, controlled by drugs. And there's genetic variation in pain in humans. It is generally the case that red-haired people are more sensitive to pain than are people with other hair colors. And I am not making that up. Every dentist knows it to be true. Okay. Anyway, I asked him, how do you assess pain sensitivity in mice. I mean, do you hit them with a hammer and see how loud they squeak or what? I mean, how do you do it? And he said, oh, it's quite simple. What we do, he says, you take your mice from different lines and you want to know whether this line is pain sensitive and that one isn't, and you put them on a hot plate. I thought, oh, really? And he said, yes, then you turn the temperature up and actually you don't turn it up very high because uh, one thing that mice really don't like is having hot feet. So if they're very sensitive to pain, and the temperature goes up to about 25 or 30, which to us is just warm, they begin to move their feet like this. And the faster they do it, the more pain they're feeling, okay? So all you have to do is to count the movement of the feet, and you've got an objective measure of pain sensitivity. And you can do crosses between lines, and you can find the genes involved, which have indeed been found, and they are, many of them are opioid receptors, okay? So I looked at that, and I thought, bloody hell. Um, I've seen these snails out in the wild in Spain on a hot day. If you put them down on a rock, they will sit there and they'll flip their front and then they'll flip their back. Flip their front and flip their back. Maybe they're doing the same thing. So what we did was to take them and to stick them on the famous hot plate um, and to, uh, in fact, use a naloxone, I won't talk about that, which is a, beta blo which is a blocker of opioid receptors, um, and ask, is there any difference in evolved pain sensitivity between populations from the north, which rather rarely have heat stress, and those from the south? How long does it take them to flip their front end or their back end when they're put on a warm plate? And the answer is, it's a striking and highly significant difference. The, the latency of heat response in Pyrenean populations is much longer than the latency of heat response in North Welsh populations. So the Pyrenean populations have an evolved ability to, with, not to feel pain, uh, um, which is not present in British, pop in British populations. And we've gone further than that. In fact, we've looked at the receptors, and there are more opioid receptors in the northern populations than in the southern populations. And as far as we know, that's the only case of geographical variation, or natural variation in pain um, threshold that's ever been found. Okay. So there's quite a strong case behind the argument that somehow what's involved both in geographical differences and possibly also in maintaining the polymorphism in Sapir is variation in response to heat, particularly heat near the ground. Well, let's briefly get back to art. Here we have snails in art. Now, many of you will know, all of you will know, of course, these wonderful Dutch flower paintings. Um, or which look very pretty and very beautiful, indeed they are. But they contain a rather dark message. The whole point of a Dutch flower painting is to draw these beautiful, fl breathtaking flowers and to insinuate into the painting worms, caterpillars, um, moths and the like, just to remind you that these flowers will soon be dead and will be consumed by worms and caterpillars and the like, and the same thing is going to happen to you, so you better be careful. Okay? So they have a message within them. And this particular um, play, uh, uh, painting by De Heim um, is called Vase Vase of Flowers, and if you look carefully, and you probably can't see it until I point it out, so I will in a moment, you'll see at the bottom left, on the, uh, just at the very bottom left, there's a snail, and about halfway up on the right, there's another snail. They're both clearly superior. There's the one on the bottom left. You can see it, I think. And there's one on the top right, also a superior. I once thought of applying for a grant to buy lots of Dutch flower paintings to see if the gene frequencies had changed over time, <laughs> given my complete failure to get about 10 grants in a row. But then I thought, actually, if I put it in, I'd probably have got it. That's a kind of mad thing that people actually uh, uh, support. Um, so again, a statement of in this complicated environment of flowers, what we've got are snails, and they're polymorphic, they're variable. So maybe there's some fit between this environmental variation and the polymorphism himself, itself, and as I said, maybe it could have something to do, um, with, uh, to do with climate. Well, I've done an awful lot of work in the Spanish Pyrenees. I told you that snails only lives, only lives in, um, 
only lives in, uh, in national parks. And this is uh, one of the national parks of the Pyrenees, magnificent part of the world. I've been going there for 40 years, going up me now. Um, and it's been slowly being ruined by ski lifts and motorways and tunnels, unfortunately. But the snails don't really seem to notice. There's still tons and tons and tons of them. Okay, so this is, well, this, is, this is the area we've done most of our work in. It's an interesting, very interesting place. It's the Valley of Aran, which is in uh, Catalonia, um, and it's a, a, a north-facing valley, valley, but it's in Spain. It's a kind of anomaly because there's a big slip in the Pyrenees, and this valley is there. And it's completely and utterly pollulating, if that's the right word, with snails. There are millions and millions of the damn things there. And it's a wonderful place to work, apart from the fact it rains all the time. That's the big downside to working on snails. They're like wet places. And one of the, the reasons it's such a good place to work is that we get snails from about 300 feet meters above sea level in the, in the, valley, bot in the valley bottom to 2,700 meters above sea level. So a huge range. And you find them in very different habitats. Here we have uh, a fairly low habitat, and you can see a uh, uh, bunch of vegetation in the front there. Snails all over that. It's a bunch of uh, trees and bushes and nettles and that kind of stuff. And you can move a few um, miles up the road. And here we've got this fine cropped pasture, not the background vegetation. And the snails are all over that too. So they're living in very different places. And it's very obvious that if you collect a population from one of those lowland sites with all kinds of variation in structure and bot botanical uh, constitution, the populations tend to be highly diverse. Here's a population from a Roland site, and you can see um, it's a sam fairly small sample, but there's a mix of light and dark colored individuals. If you go up to the highland sites where they're living on short crop turf, um, it's, uh, it's a picture I took some years ago, so it's a cr crummy picture, but basically they're all monomorphic, all for the pale coloration. So one of them remains polymorphic, the other one doesn't. I want, we began to wonder, does that have something to do with thermal relations in sunshine? In particular, does it have anything to do with a snail's perception of sunlight? Okay. Well, there are many ways to measure sunlight. There's a whole field of what's called sunfleck ecology, which may sound a bit weird, but actually is very, very important because, of course, what controls the rate at which crops grow isn't just water and the fertilizer, it's sunlight. And so crops have been, have been bred to let in more and more sun. The amount of sun is important. The, the, how tall it is is important. So there's a huge amount of data and a lot of very impressive equipment which does the job. But some of the equipment is grotesquely expensive. Uh, you can do it from, with satellite images now, but you couldn't do that when, uh, when we were doing this work. Uh, some of it's clever, but not very practical. Here's um, uh, a fisheye lens, as it's called. That's a lens which takes in the whole hemisphere. And if you were a snail looking through your fisheye lens eyes through the canopy of this, uh, of this wood, that's the way you would see the, you would see the sun. Okay? You would see little speckles of sun, little flecks of sunlight coming through. Well, we couldn't even afford those. And in fact, they didn't seem to be the appropriate thing, really. So when all else fails, you can't afford to buy the equipment, you have to start thinking. And I came up with... a. Uh, an invention which rather aggressively, perhaps, has become known as Jones's balls. And here's a picture of the famous um, spheres themselves. And what this is, it's kind of stupid, I agree. But what this is, is an attempt to measure the structural diversity from a snail's eye point of view within any particular habitat. I should say rather in brackets that we did the botany. We've looked at the um, plant species diversity down in the valley and up in the high pastures, and that simply doesn't work because some of the most diverse botanical habitats anywhere are alpine pastures, as you can see in the spring, with thousands and thousands of different species of flower. So it's not plant species diversity, it's something else. We thought it might be structural diversity. And here's a picture of a, a pretty um, structurally uh, non-diverse place. And what you do is you take these famous spheres and uh, mark off a square meter, turn around and throw them into the square meter, and they bounce around and they come to rest. Um, and that's, that's, some, that's one which, uh, which looks um, uh, rather like, uh, where you can, as you can see, you can see many of them. This is a slightly more complex habitat, and we've done exactly the same thing, and you can see fewer of them. So it seemed to us we had something which we could work with here. What we wanted to do was to have a means of measuring the extent to which the disappearance of those spheres in the vegetation told us about the amount of sunlight which was penetrating any particular piece of vegetation. What we needed was a measure of solar exposure over days, weeks, and months. 
But again, you can buy very expensive instruments that will tell you that, but we didn't have the money, so we had to think about it. God, a um, thing I haven't done for many years, I have to say. Um, so our first attempt, ludicrous though it might be, um, we started doing this perhaps in the early 70s. And uh, a few of the people in this room will remember the day, the happy days of the early 70s before the, wor before the world turned into a dystopian nightmare, um, um, where, where people wore blue jeans. And it was regarded as tremendously trendy to have faded blue jeans. So we decided to go in for, wait for a terrible joke, gene manipulation. What we did was to take out little squares of de blue denim and glue them onto snail shells in the hope that perhaps the denim would fade and tell us how long that snail had been in the sun. Um, I have to tell you, that didn't work. Um, <laughs> uh, we did it in Spain, and we saw an elderly Spanish lady picking snails, um, as they do, to eat, because they're very tasty. And she picked this up in horror and crossed herself and ran, or ran away. Um, but then we had a better idea, which is to find out what the name of the dye in the, uh, in the denim is. It's Kumasi Blue, as it's called. Buy some and mix it with a yellow paint. And if you take blue... Uh, dye, which breaks down in sunlight, and yellow paint, car paint actually, uh, or, uh, which is uh, stable in sunlight, you get a green mixture, okay? Um, and here we have the blue and the yellow overlapping to give green. And what we then did was to make, to invent, again, complicated instruments we call spiders, which are actually um, little uh, washers which th with ties on them, cover them with uh, this uh, green fading paint, and put them um, put them in the, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the position where the spheres had been, okay? And we left them there for a, it only took a day, actually, for, them to f for those to fade. We left them there, and we got a measure of the extent of thermal complexity in a particular habitat. How much variation in fading was there from green to yellow? And we had a scale of green to yellow. How much variation in fading was there in a particular habitat? And you can see, first of all, that there was a great deal of variation, and secondly, that the extent of variation was um, much, much greater in places where the extent of snail polymorphism was much greater, where there was more variation in the thermal habitat which the snails lived in. So the snails lived on a flat piece of grassland. They were all facing the same thermal stresses. They couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't climb. They couldn't hide. Um, and so uh, they had no variation in, fa in fading score and, no, um, and very little polymorphism. Well, that's all well and good. But what you'd really want to do is to find out, ask the question from the snail's point of view. And here, that's what we then did. Here we have two snails from the same population, one of which has been out in the sun for a long time, the one on the right, the green has faded quite a lot, the one on the left has been scarcely in the sun at all. And what we did then was to establish the University College London Snail Ranch, um, which is on a field site belonging to Oxford University, with that you know, very hot place, that great boiling pall of self-congratulation hanging over the whole place, so it's always hot. Um, uh, and uh, we made a snail ranch of 100 cages. This is it taken from the air. It took a bloody long time, I'll tell you. 100 cages, each one a meter across. Um, and, uh, uh, and we put thousands of snails in them. Uh, we did many things, but this is one of the things we did. And we asked the question, if you take snails which are banded, striped, and dark, um, versus those which are unbanded, unstriped, and not dark. Is there any difference which in, 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 in the degree to which each individual is exposed to sunlight? And the answer was clearly yes. Uh, I did this very quickly like yes, yesterday, so I haven't got proper parameters on it. But it's clear there's a highly significant difference in that the uh, banded individuals are, are much more are exposed to sunlight um, than are the unbanded individuals. And the banded individuals, let's remind ourselves, are those which suffer most when they're under heat stress. In other words, when they're near the ground, they have to escape by going higher in the vegetation. Okay? Um, you can do the obvious experiment. You can do some phenotypic engineering, and you can paint the light ones dark and the dark ones light. And when that happens, they switch their behavior. They switch their behavior so that the ones which used to be banded but are now white are, behave in exactly the opposite way from which they did before. And the same for the black ones. This is a rather crummy slide, but it's exactly the same. Um, it's exactly the same phenomenon. So let me end the talk with perhaps the most direct interaction I know about, about the interaction of snails and art. Um, I once um, 
wrote a book. I didn't feel myself to be the new Darwin, which Steve never admitted that directly, but I think he probably, in the back of his mind, he thought he was. Uh, um, but I did greatly admire both the old Darwin and, indeed, Steve Gould, a great evolutionary biologist as he was, as he was. And rather daringly, in 1999, I tried to rewrite the origin of species as if it was being rewritten, as if it was being written today. I used the structure of Darwin's long argument, you know, uh, chapter by chapter, uh, relic organs, uh, geography, all that stuff. It, I can tell you it was completely astounding how well that structure stood up and how well it supported the edifice of modern evolutionary biology. You could put in papers from last year, which Darwin had really predicted almost what, what we were going to find. But that's what I did. So I took, I called it almost like a whale after a quote from Darwin, uh, which he was much uh, laughed about, saying that you could imagine a bear swing with an open mouth almost like a whale, and it wasn't out of the possibility that a, an enormous race of whale-like bears might evolve. People mocked him for that, but in fact he was dead right. So I did that, and there's the origin, okay? Actually, it's a first edition, that origin, so it's worth a lot of money. Then I was, gave a talk somewhere where somebody came up to me and said, I'm an artist, and whereupon my heart usually sinks to my boots. Um, but this guy was a nice guy. He was a guy called Finley Taylor, and quite a well-known um, uh, artist in the modern sense where you do surprising things. And what he wanted to do was to take a copy of my book, almost like a whale, and a copy of The Origin of Species, I hope not the 1859 edition, otherwise he would have shot himself badly in the foot, but the Victorian edition, and put them in his garden for three months over the summer. Um, and uh, uh, they would be eaten by snails, okay, because it was wet, and you'd do the experiments, which ones would the snail like most? And this is the result. <laughs> the snails preferred Darwin, and do you blame them? Thank you. Thank you.